Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Beyond Eight Figures. This is AJ, your journeyman entrepreneur, ready to share with you a great interview about the realities of building and growing a company beyond eight figures. Today's guest is a personal friend of mine, but more importantly, for at least the show, he is a incredible entrepreneur. He started his first business when he was 19 years old, and he had no clue what he was doing when he started. But he grew, and he became involved with every aspect of starting and growing that business. He didn't have much of a personal life, and that did become a something as he grew his family. But he was successful. And in 2011, he sold the company for a pretty penny. But he used his experience and battle scars to drive him to find a better way to grow a business. He's done this. He uses his new experience, his new concepts to not only run his company, his new companies, but to support and mentor other entrepreneurs. His secret sauce is that he's become advocate for delegating and outsourcing the work necessary for growing your company. He so much believes in this that he's written a book. Like I said early, he is a friend of mine. So I was very, very lucky to get my hands on an early copy a couple of weeks ago. And my mind was truly blown. I've been incorporating so much of it over the past couple of weeks that I wanted to have him on the show and share with you different aspects from the book. In his new book, Outsourcing for Success, How to Make the Most of Freelance Talent and Boost Your Business, he shares how to get the most from this freelancing talent and how to use the talent to scale your business to the next level without sacrificing your life. Let's let him talk to you. Welcome, my favorite drinking buddy, Kevin Ashcroft. Hey, Kevin. Thank you again for coming on the show. I'm really, really excited to get a chance to talk to you about your new book. As I was mentioning earlier, I was very excited when you started talking about writing this because over the past five years since I sold my company and looking to kind of create that next company, I've so rebuilt my business to really focus around outsourcing my talent and having a global talent base and the sophistication and the intelligence you're bringing to the process of doing so really just blew me away. So can you tell us, how did you come about to decide to write the book? Thanks, AJ. And I appreciate the invite to, to, to come on the show. The inspiration, I guess, to, to write the book literally came to me one day as I was sitting in a cafe in Spain, having a glass of wine and some pasta for lunch. As I was talking to a couple of my freelancers via email and Skype, um, literally the, the idea just came to me that wouldn't it be really useful to have a book on the subject of outsourcing and how it works and you know how to make use of it, how it can impact your business, how it can actually impact your life. And it can make quite a difference there. And so it came to me in that afternoon. And within about 30 minutes, I had written down the, the list of contents. I had written down the content pages and the general structure for the book. And what I immediately done as soon as that part had finished and the glass of wine had gone and the pasta was removed from the table was I emailed five or six people just to let them know that I had decided to write a book. And the reason for that for me was, was so that I had some level of accountability, which is a real big thing in my life. The more accountability that's there, the better I tend to do and the more I achieve and the more I follow through, which I guess is a kind of common sense thing. So I emailed five or six people just to say, you know, listen, I'm writing a book. It's about outsourcing. I'm hoping to have it finished within about 12 months. And at that point, that gave me a little bit of certainty that I would progress with it because I had put it out there and I didn't want to go back to people in, in 12 months time and tell them nothing had <laughs> happened. You know? So I got the content, I emailed those people and really that's, that's where it started. As I mentioned in the intro, you and I know each other. So I, I knew about this pretty early on. I was, as I said, excited about it. When you sold your IT company and you started up this thing, what kind of led down the path to 
really rebuilding your business around outsourcing. And yeah, maybe even better is share with us that, but then also how you can see other entrepreneurs following your footsteps in doing so. Yes. Yeah, so the reason for me trying this different model was that I'd started my first business when I was 19, which is a long time ago now, as, as you well know. But a few years. Well, you can few see years. the wrinkles on my face. So um, <laughs> I'm older. So, yeah. That's 30 years ago. And I started that business at 19. And pretty quickly, I had started staff in that business and we grew it to, to a good size in the Scottish marketplace. Over those almost 20 years of having that business, we employed, you know, hundreds of people, not at the one time, but we had different people come in and out of the business as, as you would expect yeah. in that length of time. And there's, there's a lot of positives to having a, a team and an office and, and working there together. But there's also negatives. And as I seen business evolving in the type of businesses that I wanted to get involved in, and, and for me, that was more about remote businesses. That was location independent businesses. And anything I look at now has to have location independence as a core part of it. Mm -hmm. And so when I started the, the marketing business Blinkered in 2011 or, or thereabouts, my focus mm -hmm. at that point was to try and make it different, not to have offices, not to have staff members working 40 hours a week or whatever their particular contract would be. It was to have a lot more flexibility. It was to bring people in who were specialists in their particular areas and really to get a business model where there was a lot more flexibility, where I could upscale quicker and also that I could downscale if the inquiries reduced or the client demands reduced, then I had that option. And that's when I turned to outsourcing and I made a very specific decision at that point that I wouldn't hire any traditional full-time staff. I wouldn't have a, a physical office and I would look to build a much more flexible business that I hoped would be more enjoyable and more profitable and, and in general, just make it a nicer, a nicer business and something that I guess with the location independence, I could be anywhere and run it. And those were some big points for me. So you go from beautiful Scotland to some non-exotic Southern Spain, if I'm correct. So location independence seemed to have worked for the past 10 years now. Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we didn't move to Spain 10 years ago, so we moved almost four years ago. But what was really nice about it was we made the decision to move. We had an opportunity with the age that our kids were at, that we felt mm -hmm. it was a time that we could move. We could move them without much disruption to the schooling. And we, we had actually an option at that point. We were thinking of either moving to England which was the preference for my wife and for, for my two kids. We did a pros and cons checklist. We all sat down and we said, you know, if we're going to make this move, where would we like to be? My view was we could move to England or somewhere else in Scotland at any point. It was an easy move. Yeah. But we have this one opportunity as a family to do something a little bit different. So we did our lists and we looked at the lists and I was the only one that picked Spain. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, so, so it's fair to say that I got defeated in the vote but time was on my side in that my wife Joan has a horse and it was winter time when we started to do the list it was getting very close to Christmas and she was going up to the horse and she was doing the mucking out each day and she was literally smashing the top of the water buckets to remove half inch inch thick ice so that she could give the horses water and, and those kind of things. And she came back down one day from the horse, I think fair to say, pretty defeated and in, in fairly low spirits, cold, wet, miserable. And she'd been up there for two hours or so, a real heavy shift. And this is a daily occurrence for, for a horse person. And she came in the door, we had a cup of tea, a quick chat. And then she said, you know, that, 
that Spain idea? Could we maybe just revisit that again? And so the conversation went from there. That was near Christmas. In the February, we went over up to the Murcia region of Spain. We had a look there for a couple of days. And then in the April, we came down to the southern part, to the Costa del Sol. We stayed here with the kids for about 10 days. And we made a decision that it could work and let's give it a try. And in the August, mid-August, we moved over to Spain. And the, the great thing about that from a business perspective and location independence was that whilst I moved country, I still operated the business the exact same way as I had been the day before. So it was really fluid and it was really simple. And that's because I had set the business up that way. So it's been a real positive and it's made that very easy for us as a family. Yeah, I think a lot of people think about the location independence and all the movement, but it's also the idea that once it's set up and you are moving and you kind of go, and I love how in your book you kind of talk about the process and setting up. So let's kind of next talk about that. But this idea that once you're there, you do have your decisions of where to go, how to spend your time become secondary to the running of the business. The running of your business is not affected by how you decide or where you decide to be. It seems so obvious, and especially now after COVID, but 2011, it really wasn't. So that's really impressive. You took that route back then. In speaking of this, I'm talking about COVID and how you talk about looking at it. I know a lot of people, a lot of our listeners, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially with COVID and everything, are taking outsourcing more seriously. Where would you suggest people start focusing or looking at outsourcing as part of their business? How would you suggest people you know, start getting their feet, their toes wet? So I think the best idea that anyone could ever make is obviously to buy the book. That would... That would <laughs> yes. You know, that would, and we'll have the link in the show notes, everyone. So joking aside, that, 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 it's a good starting point, obviously. But mm -hmm. start small. Don't overthink it and go in with a, t a task or a set of tasks that would be useful if it could be completed for your business by someone else, but that, that isn't confidential, that isn't going to be difficult to describe, that mm -hmm. won't cost you a lot of money, so it's not a huge investment. And so start, start small, get some tasks out there not research the marketplaces if you've read the book, but if you've not, then research some marketplaces yeah. and try writing some job posts, go through the interview process and see how it works for you. Hire a couple of people, small tasks. You can hire multiple people for the one task and it lets you see how different people approach it. And that's a really sensible way to start to get used to it. It's safe. It doesn't cost you a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time. And then it just lets you get some experience to then move forward to, to more involved tasks or bigger projects. Well, one of the things I really did like in the book, and I hadn't really thought of it because I had my, you know, my experience, I had sort of individually cherry picked people, but you talk a lot about people creating and I'm going to massacre it. So please step in no basically creating their own agencies on top of some of the platforms. And I know like you do this also with the WordPress support and the marketing for your companies. I really do like that concept because it's this idea that you're still going forward as a business owner, instead of getting some of the more established agency structure, you're kind of getting a hybrid agency and getting that sort of like, all right, you're taking on the idea of finding the freelancers and the consultants and the contractors who do the work and then sort of pull pull that all together to make it work for me. And I can still interact with you either as an agency or through the contractor platform. I think that's a very interesting hybrid that you've started developing and you reference a few times in the book. So that's pretty cool. How did that kind of come about? It was natural for me because it was just another way of building a team, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess you can look at it in two ways, or, or there's multiple ways that you may use the freelancing model. So 
You can use it to get people to do specific tasks or mini projects or bigger projects and you can bring those people in on an ad hoc basis. Or you can look to build your entire team this way or a mm -hmm. portion of your team this way. And so you're effectively, as you, as you rightly say, you're building like a hybrid agency. The benefit of doing it for me and the reason I went that way was tapping into specialists. So I guess an example of that could be you may have a web developer that's part of the team and a client may ask you to like, set up Google Tag Manager and set up specific analytics and, and triggers within the website. Now, that's something you could get the, the developer to do, but it's not their main skill set. And then what happens is they have to spend time to learn it. They may not do it correctly. They may miss some things. It's going to take them longer than is necessary and you're pulling them away from their core tasks. And so pulling in someone who is a specialist in Google Tag Manager, as, as an example, works really well. It's probably going to cost you a little bit more than your developer, but the time they take to complete the task is going to be smaller. There'll be less issues in communication from your perspective, and it's very likely to be done right first time on time. And so that's kind of one of the examples of, of bringing in specialists when you need, which helps you build an agency and it helps you build more of a, a breadth of service rather than, than being quite narrow. So you can help your clients more. And that has been a good way for, for me to build the business. And there's lots of examples of other companies out there who are doing similar things, who are actually operating agencies within the marketplaces that we talk about in the book. You'll find freelancers on there, and then you'll find freelancers who are part of agencies. And some of these agencies are, are turning over multiple millions per year just in individual marketplaces. That is really cool. And you mentioned it there in your example about the, the extra quality. You bring this up quite often I th in the book. I think there's this popular conception out there and I know in some of the business groups I am that it's like freelancers, a buck an hour, you know, or the cheapest possible rate. And yet I think that in my experience that <laughs> you get what you pay for. Can you kind of talk to like how a price conscious entrepreneur kind of on their business on the way up, they're not some huge company that has tons of free cash flow, but they're in a position to add up. Yet the balance that question of quality of deliverable versus affordability. How do you kind of see that lever playing out? So I think a big thing for a small business owner or entrepreneur or even mid-sized business owner is that you're not necessarily looking to bring the, the person on full time. You know, in a traditional marketplace, maybe you're bringing someone on part time, but often it's full time. You may have recruitment fees. You've got the salary. If you're in the UK, for instance, you've got employers, tax and national insurance and multiple other costs round about it. When you go down the freelancer model, then you can bring them in for a task or a project. So you've not got this huge cost. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, as you touch on, there are a wide range of rates and you can go down yeah. to maybe $3 an hour up to $500 an hour or more, depending on the task and the role, the freelancer and the marketplace you look at. So you've got a wide, you've got a wide choice there to, to look at. For some people, depending on the task, someone at three or four or $5 an hour may be fine, but you're not going to get a really good web developer for that. You're not going to get a great marketing person for that. You're not going to get a great virtual assistant for that. You have to be realistic in what your expectations are. The higher the rate, the better the reviews, the more experience, then the less time you need to communicate, the, mm -hmm. the more likely you're going to get something done right first time. You're going to get a higher quality of work. They're going to check their work better and they're, they're going to finish quicker because they know what they're doing. So it's about getting a balance. Don't expect everything to be, to be dirt cheap. You know, there is a cost benefit that you can get using the freelancer model. But for me, it's been more about flexibility. It's been getting tasks done later in the evening, earlier in the morning, or when I'm asleep. 
It's getting it done right first time by someone who's experienced. It's also when you deal with good people and specialists, you get a different level of feedback. You get ideas. You get communication that can actually help you with your services and your client. It can help you get more business from your clients and you get happier clients. So that's the kind of mix for, for me. You can save money, but generally for me, that, that's based around the fact you're not employing someone full time. You're bringing them in as and when you need them. And so you've got that flexibility. It's more about the structural savings versus the direct per hour comparison. Yeah, completely. And, and also, if, if I think back to running my traditional business, often because you've got staff there, they may not necessarily be running at 100%. You give them tasks that they don't have experience in. And what, what I've found through personal experience is, A, they don't necessarily like getting a task that they don't know how to do. Um, B, when they do it, because they don't have experience in it, you can get mixed results. C, it, it takes longer for them to complete it. D, e, when you get it back, and if it's not right, you get frustrated, you get annoyed, you get a bit resentful, you think, my God, can this person not just do this? And so just having the, the flexibility to bring in someone who can do specific things for you that your existing team can't do is a, is a huge bonus. That really does resonate because I built my business around that concept. But there was something you shared with me a couple of years ago, and it was great to see it in the book because I was like, oh, wait, that is so cool because now I remember to actually do it. It's not so much about trying to find the cheapest thing, but finding the diamonds in the rough, you know, and you know, could you kind of explain a little bit to the audience of like, yes, it's not this idea of finding the cheapest, but finding what is a diamond in the rough and how can a business owner go find a diamond in the rough. So the reality of that on the, on the marketplaces is that it takes you a bit longer than going for mm -hmm. someone with Great. all the experience and all the reviews. So you look for things like how well their profile's written. When you interview them, for me personally, I really focus on their communication and their communication style because I find that when someone's got some experience in tasks, it's quite easy to train them and, and get them a deeper skill set and, and get their level of experience and ability. You can get that moved faster, quicker and, and yeah. better. But if their communication's bad, if, if, if that's inherently poor and they don't get what you're saying or they come back with completely different answers, that part is exceptionally hard to train and get right. And so that's, that's one of the first things that, that I look for, if I can communicate easily with them, because if I can do that, then there's a big chance that we can work together. Over and above that, it's, it's the work ethic. It's kind of what they're about, the effort they put in, the care that they take with trial tasks and, and things like that, AJ. So when you work through making sure they've got strong communication, and they've got that desire to learn and do better and build their own business because effectively they're self-employed. They are yeah. effectively running their own micro business. And if they've got that attention to detail and they care about the results for you, those two things give you a really great starting point. And the rest of it, assuming they've got skills in the, in the general area that you want them to work in, the rest of that can be developed really quite quickly. So that's been a way that it's made it easier for me to, to decide quickly whether to give someone more tasks, whether to invest in them with some more training and more of my time. And, and that's worked well for me over the last 10, 11 years of, of using the outsourcing model. You talk about having sort of a core team and then having freelancers come in and out. This has sometimes been a mental issue for me in, in talking with other business owners, other entrepreneurs. It's like, how do you balance the mix of having consistent people working on your business, contractors full-time, however that definition, and then people doing bits and pieces? How far do you bring them in? Can you kind of maybe walk us through some of 
the variations you see and some of the things you try to strive for in that mixed team concept? Yeah, so we effectively have people in the team that, that are full time with us, that work mm. 30, 35, 40 hours a week. And that, that works great for us there. As you see, the core team, they carry out very specific tasks day in, day out. So for instance, in the WP support specialist business, we have Peter, who's one of the core team there. He does all the regular reports. He manages the ticketing system. So he manages all the calls that come in for support and development. And he then either does those calls himself or depending on what the, the client's asking for, he'll then set them to a, a web designer or a web developer or a Google specialist or whatever it may be, or a graphics specialist. So we have a core team because we know the, the amount of business and the requests that we're taking care of on a regular basis. And it gives us flexibility that if we get big demand, for instance, for website designs, our normal guys in the team that we have there can deal with about 90, 95% of that. But if we have some other urgent projects, then we have freelancers that we use on an ad hoc basis. And so they may get past a project once every two weeks, once every month, once every couple of months. We tell them up front what the expectation is. So we tell them, you know, some weeks we may give you one hour of work, some weeks maybe 40 hours of work, some weeks there could be big projects that may take months. So we set their expectations up front so that they know what our relationship is. And what, it, what I've experienced it does is it builds a, a nice level of trust and they know yeah. that as and when we need them, we'll bring them in and they can do a good job for us. And so it works well for them because they've got multiple clients themselves and they're working across different continents with different clients and our, our job just fills in another little gap for them. It's good because they've got the relationship with us, they know how we work, they know what our standards are, so they fit into our, our process. And it's easy for them because they don't need to go through an interview process with someone else. We've already agreed a rate, so everything's really straightforward. So we've got that core team, and then we've got the team that we bring in as and when we need to, who we've got relationships with. And then sometimes we'll need to go and find someone new, and we go through creating the, the statement of work, creating the, the job description, deciding what marketplace we're going to use, go through the interview process, and then we make some new hires from there. And again, depending on the job, the role, we set their expectations so that they know how much work they're likely to get from us, whether it's a one-off yeah. project or, or whatever. But there's lots of people over the years that we still use on an ad hoc basis and we've got a great relationship with. And, and that flexibility is, is absolutely brilliant, great way to, to build the business. Even taking from that, the idea of like your company culture sort of filtering through different aspects of the depth of the relationship. And after a year of COVID, sorry, this just kind of made me think, how do you see outsourcing changing or what's what's really interesting to you first about what's going on with outsourcing right now yeah so i i don't think it's necessarily going to change in so much as it's going to become something different it's it's always been there well obviously yeah. because you know I, i've been involved in it for 10 years 11 years and people have been using it long before then so if you think of like the, the four hour work week as a book, that was really, you know, a chunk of that was all about um, him using freelancers from the Philippines and various other places to, to fill the gaps for him. So it's been, it's been about for a long time. I think what is happening now with, with COVID is that people have realized because their teams have had to work from home, work remotely, work in a different yeah. way, Businesses, business owners, entrepreneurs have realized the important thing often is not about having a physical person sitting there in the office at a desk for 40 hours a week and then measuring them by the fact they're there. The important thing is to measure the output, 
what it is they actually do, what they contribute, and what those results are. And strangely, there are some positives, I think, that will come from the the pandemic. And I think part of that is, is realising that you don't need a person chained to a desk to get the results. And if that then means individuals don't need to travel or commute for two hours to the office, which often for people is a horrendous experience, and the same in the way back, if they then get more time with their family, their friends, more time for themselves, and they can produce the quality of work that's required, I think that's enormous. So I think what's coming out of it is it's opening the eyes of many people to say that remote working is more of an option than they thought possible. They can see ways of dealing with their trust issues, which is more about the managers, the directors, the employers, the entrepreneurs than it is about the, the staff, really. So if they can find a way of dealing with that, trusting the team, finding a good way for the team to work remotely together, and, and there's so many options now, whether it's the, the likes of Zoom, whether it's in project management systems like Asana and Basecamp, there's thousands of options for people to work together in a really good way. So I, I think one of the big things is it's opening the eyes of people in business. It's helping them build more trust because they've been forced in to doing it. And I think they'll think about business differently. That's not to say everybody will stay with a remote model or everybody will be full time remote. There's still going to be a mix, but I think ultimately they'll have more trust and more flexibility of trying it. And hopefully the book will, will give some insights into how to do that in the best way possible, how to make it a, a safer experience, maybe. And as we touched on earlier, you know, go into the process in a, in a smaller, more gentle fashion to test things out, to get used to it and to, and to build your experience and then build more of the business from there. Yeah, definitely from reading the book and seeing the process and the way, just the, you know, your examples and then the forms to use and stuff is really very helpful and kind of, I think, reducing that piece. One thing I thought was really interesting, maybe you can talk about the process of this, but how do you give back? Because I think the audience would like the way that you do this. So what I'm starting now is, I guess, something a little bit different with this and my kind of personal brand website, kevashcroft.com, we've got a, a giving back section. So it's something that I've done for a long time in my life. And it's something I really enjoy doing. And whether you're standing in a car park and someone doesn't have 50p or a pound to pay for their ticket, or whether you're at the checkout in a supermarket and they're short of a couple of quid, it doesn't take much to just hand over that little bit to help them complete the transaction. And the feeling I get from it personally, from a selfish point of view, is wonderful. I think the feeling that the other person gets is often surprise initially, but then some feeling of, of connection and, and happiness because someone's done something good for them that they don't know. Yeah. But what I would like to do, you know, I would like to take it a little bit further. So these are kind of serendipitous things that happen. And I'm trying to, I guess, maybe create more of a regular serendipity moment that happens. So in the personal website, I'm talking about two things where I'm going to give back actively. One of those is mentoring. And I'm opening up four slots every six months. So every six months, we take on four new mentees. And really, that's to help provide accountability for them, to help them get some sort of usefulness out of the process. I went over for the last 30 years. You've been there as well, AJ, as, a, as an entrepreneur and a business owner. You make a lot of good decisions, but often the big experiences you get are from the, the bad decisions that you make and the yes. learning you get from that. You know, assuming that, just a yeah, assuming you don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again and you learn from them. And yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of experience I've got there from making good decisions and bad ones that I think can help people who are either starting out on a new business 
or who are already in business but they don't feel they're getting to where they, they expect they should be or they hope they would be. And I hope that that process will be useful to those people. And the second piece of giving back is once per month we're going to select someone or business where they need a good professional website to support what they're trying to do, to give them a good window onto the world so that when people visit their business, they get the correct impact and, and experience that they would yeah. expect them to get. So those are two things we hope that are a good way of giving back. And we're going to pick people, as, as we say, we'll go through a, a kind of process, a questionnaire. And people who are running businesses are starting a business and who have part of their business is giving back also. We'll be given preference as to likely being chosen because what I want to do is, is try and continue that chain as much as possible where there's more people giving back in an active way rather than a passive way, rather than it kind of just happening in the moment. So that's the that's the giving back piece. You know, we've always supported charities and there's many there that we take care of that we provide free support in the WP support business or we help them with web with web needs in the blinker business. But this is something kind of more specific and active that we're trying to put in place and I hope it hits the right chord and I hope it's I hope it's useful. I really thought that was very interesting, that way of giving back and just sort of being more actively involved in sort of the success or the opportunity for those people who get selected. We'll make sure that we have a link to Kevin's personal website and this program in our show notes. So please, if you are interested in learning more or talking to Kevin about it, please go check him out. And we'll have, once again, in the show notes, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much for being on the show. Since you do have a book coming out, would you tell folks a little bit about what they can expect? Let's just summarize quickly, just to close this out, why it's so great, because I was very excited in reading one of the earlier versions. I know it's still being fine-tuned, but I was very, just the amount of actionable insights and examples and documents and stuff. There will be links. Can you tell us a little bit what comes with the book? And then we'll send everyone off. Yeah, no problem. So the point of the book really is, is to give business owners and entrepreneurs an insight into outsourcing and how they can use it in their business to make their lives easier, to help them scale the business, to help them grow the business, to get access to skills and services that maybe they don't have or maybe they, they find it hard to access. So that's kind of a, a core part of it. We talk in the book about the pros and cons because it's important to understand that whilst there's a huge number of positives, there are some negatives to the outsourcing side. In reality, they're not really that different to employing traditional staff the way we have for, for thousands of years. But we lay that out as well so that everybody's clear on, on what to expect. There are a huge number of marketplaces where you can go and, and find talent. Traditional places like LinkedIn and so on are becoming more of a, a an option a, as well as more people move to a freelancing model. But there's there's loads of marketplaces like Upwork and Freelancer and Readsy and, and so on. So we talk about a number of those marketplaces and, and give you a kind of heads up on what to expect from them, what they're best for, what they're more suited to. And then we move on in the book to a section that, that I've titled Steps for Success. And really what that takes you through is how to write your scope of works, how to write a good job description, why it's important, how to work through your interview techniques, how to screen people, how to work through the selection process, how to manage them and onboard them into your business and, and your way of working. And then we talk at the, at the end of the book on sections that are quite important for people like what happens if the job's not going well what happens if it's going really slowly what if the freelancer vanishes so there's a lot of sections in there that we go through that are natural parts that i've learned over the last 10 years of dealing with freelancers and, and agencies on these marketplaces so what we're doing there effectively is is, is condensing my knowledge 
of the, the pain points that may happen and how to deal with them so that either they, they don't happen or it minimises the interruption to you and your business or, or any hassle that, that you may get. So that's that's kind of the book in a nutshell. It's there to to help people understand outsourcing is a, is, is a really great option. How best yeah. you access it, how to make it as painless as possible, how to give you the best chance of success with it. And hopefully it covers everything that people will need to to get into this. I'm going, I'm going to say a new way of working. It's not really because it's been there for a while, but I think because so few people have so tapped sure. into it. Yeah. So few people have tapped into it that it's 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 kind of new, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I definitely think I think this is without a doubt, you know, two years ago it started becoming a bigger and bigger conversation. The past year obviously has and I think people are looking now at talent as a global structure, not just a regional. And you go deep into your book of how to take advantage of that. So definitely we'll have links to it. And to the book, to Amazon, of course, and to your site where people can. And I know you will have, you are putting together some special things for buyers. So we'll have links to those too when those come out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. I greatly appreciate you coming on the show. I know our audience learned a lot and we look forward to seeing the book in print. Fantastic. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, AJ. Talk. Take care. Wow. Thank you so much, Kev. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing with us. I can't wait to have you back on the show to even go deeper into detail. Plus, looking really forward to getting together and having a beer soon. If you want to connect with Kevin, find out more information about the launch of his book and all the specials he's going to have with it, or his Giving Back Mentoring Program, look in the show notes below and you'll find all the details there. Don't forget to subscribe to Beyond Eight Figures and be the first one to know about new guests and experts coming to the show and the ability for you to ask them questions. To our next episode, this is AJ. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Mm -hmm.